Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Shannon Derejo from Crema Media. Welcome to today's webinar on hydrogen, where a panel of experts will discuss the policies to expand investments in this new clean energy source. Today's webinar is sponsored by RSTAL, the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, Enatrug, ENGI, HISA Infrastructure, Norton Rose Fulbright, Oxion People Solutions, RTS Africa, and Ukwazi. Without them, this event would not be possible. Before we begin, please be aware that we have enabled the Q&A function, so please post any questions into the Q&A box. You'll find this on the panel at the bottom of your screen. The facilitator will pick out themes in the questions and answer as many of them as possible throughout the discussion. To encourage interaction, we have also enabled the chat function, so you can network with the panelists via the chat box. You'll find this at the bottom of your screen. Please don't post any questions in the chat box, though, as we may miss them. Post those into the Q&A instead. Please be aware that we are recording this webinar and we'll be sending the recording to you when it's available. Today's webinar will be facilitated by Matt Ash, head of the Norton Rose Fulbright Energy Group for Sub-Saharan Africa. He is based in Cape Town. A core focus of the energy group is the energy transition to renewable and alternative energy sources, including hydrogen. Matt is a highly experienced and trusted advisor to clients across a wide variety of industries, including energy, transport and civil infrastructure, water and food security, and disruptive agri-tech projects. Matt offers a broad range of services across the spectrum of the energy sector and on major infrastructure initiatives. He will facilitate the discussion with our panel, which consists of Thomas Ruiz, Principal Research Engineer for Natural Resources and the Environment at the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, Kashifa Bjorkas, CEO of Freeport Saldana, Shahil Jagannath, Business Developer from NG, and Ugur Unel, Segment Manager for Hydrogen and LNG at RSTAL. I'll hand over now to our facilitator, Matt Ash, to take the proceedings forward. Over to you, Matt. If I may then just segue across to you, Shahil, very quickly, if, if you could, um, look, without, uh, without disclosing anything that is confidential, but uh, Angie is, is quite involved in a number of projects nascent in, in South Africa at the moment. Can you talk to, uh, to a little bit about that in, in, in the context of, of the scene that, that Thomas has just set? Thanks. Uh, thanks, Matt. Um, currently, NGE has a unique positioning and value proposition um, from its expertise in renewable energy, its business model, its R&D capabilities, and its focus on partnerships. And that's made us look at the hydrogen sector in South Africa as something that we would like to explore and something that we would like to um, unlock to its full potential. So in South Africa itself, we are currently uh, involved and we are producing hi green hydrogen at the, uh, at the Nugen plant, uh, which we call Project Rhino with Anglo-American. This is producing green hydrogen to power a mining truck, which is being used for the mining activities at the Mokhala Kuena mine. We're also involved with several other partnerships within the country, uh, especially with Soldana, uh, to develop the first green iron ore corridor between South Africa and the EU. Uh, so this aims to decarbonize elements of shipping and the mining sector, as well as the Soldana IDZ. So if you could just, uh, um, just to embroider on that a little, um, because many won't understand necessarily what you mean by green corridor. Are you talking about the decarbonization of the transportation of iron ore? So with regards to the commodity, commodities market, I think that as time goes by and as the decarbonization targets of the EU and other places around the world uh, come up on us, we need to look at how do we decarbonize both the transportation, the production, and all other elements of the that, that are involved in creating this iron ore and other mi minerals as well. So this initiative itself, it's called the Green Iron Ore Corridor. So we're looking specifically at the shipping, uh, but this can be expanded as we see the need 
uh, for the country and for the IDZ itself. So that could be everything in the value chain from the actual production of the, you know, the mining of the ore to the transportation of that from, say, Session 2 down to Saldana. And we'll chat to to Kashif in, in, in a second about uh, the opportunities in, in Saldana Bay. And then the transportation of that ore from Saldana to its various markets on green powered ships, if I can put it that way. Ideally, that's exactly what we would love to do. Yeah. And I think that's what's needed for the country and the world. Yeah, okay. If I could then just quickly touch across to you, Ugo. Um, uh, uh, um, Shahil has mentioned very briefly, you know, this green uh, corridor, so to speak. But, you know, the export of product to the EU is becoming more and more of a challenge. And I know that Stahl is is mostly involved in the health and safety aspects of hydrogen, but also perhaps you can also give some insight onto what those what those challenges are. In particular, you know the um, the directives coming out of the EU regarding the import of of ammonia, for example, and what it needs to comply with. Sorry, I'm afraid um, you're talking into the ether. Ugo. So, can you hear me? Okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. From um, at first, uh, of course, um, the handling with hydrogen is uh, very, very um, important. Of course, with or to shipping uh, to work with with hydrogen or uh, the, the 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 handling. And uh, I see example in the, in the, in the growing the market uh, example in hydrogen um, in in the market of, of of potential of key players in the transition um, to a more sustainable and low carbon energy system and i see here is very important to declare the uh, safety in in these applications and uh, you should see um, that um, the fire explosion hazards hydrogen example is highly flammable and can ignite readily in the uh, uh, presence of air oxygen um, or other oxidation agents it can also explode if uh, released and ignite in an enclosed space Therefore, it is uh, important to handle and uh, store hydrogen safety and avoid uh, the risk of the the, uh, the fire or explosions. And um, we, as a style, we can uh, offer more and different solution uh, for uh, the different customer, different applications for uh, X atmosphere and hazardous X, uh, atmosphere and. Um, for projecting, for training, and, um, and to uh, work with the customer in, 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 in deep together. Yeah, I guess if one um, if one wants a real live example of how dangerous hydrogen is, you just have to look at the Hindenburg. But um, fortunately, we're kind of past that that sort of thing. But uh, we would we would um, obviously expect, and I, I guess that the EU is going to be highly regulatory in in these respects regarding um, uh, regarding the health and safety, or particularly the safety aspects on on hydrogen import and well not just production but import and and handling but if i can just then also touch base with you kashifa on the export side if you could give us some insights into what advantages idz i mean you're from the soldana idz but i guess you can speak on an almost generic basis for the advantages of having um hydrogen produced and exported from um an industrial development zone yeah oh, thanks matt uh, three things uh, are top of mind. Uh, one is SEZs are, in essence, export hubs. That is that is the, the job that they have to do. It's about manufacturing and exporting the goods and services that are produced in, in those. And also, historically, where our SEZs are placed are also quite in and or around port. Uh, so inland, I mean, you've got uh, our temple, which is close to... Um, or Tambo, uh, the airport. But, uh, you know, all, all the other issues that are largely uh, close to operational ports. So, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a direct benefit that you have industrial location right next to an export uh, uh, hub place. Secondly, I think, is that the, the manufacturing, the equipment manufacturing uh, potential um, and the benefits that the SEZ can uh, offer through its SEZ framework of incentives and programs and, 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 and the work that we have created in the SEZ program to create that enabling environment to attract the value chain 
because we are starting uh, um, very. I mean, this is a this is an emerging market for for many people. Green hydrogen. Obviously, South Africa has a long legacy of producing hydrogen at scale, um, but the locations are new, and I think that's also kind of we can maybe if we go there like this interesting democratization of where energy is and where uh, such a key fuel for the future is being created potentially. I think that's also an interesting conversation. And then, then lastly, the benefit is that the SEZs, the SEZ operators are geared. I mean, it's in their essence is to be welcoming to investment and also acknowledging the challenges that investors, uh, local and international, uh, uh, face in investing in South Africa. And um, we play a key coordination role between all the role players to actually understand what is what are the um, roadblocks? What uh, and and also I want to say not just like on the negative side, but on the positive side. What are the opportunities that we can put in into the, our economy, into our ecosystem, to actually make sure that the investment does happen and it reaches the full benefit that we all want to see um, for South for South Africa. So okay. I think those three for me are the top. Yeah, but without wanting to put you on your on the spot. Um, and I'm trying, going to try not to, because you, you're speaking from an IDZ perspective. But you know, the export of product requires a very deft interface with the port operator. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about National Ports Authority in, in this particular instance. And so um, uh, what, what kind of measures are you taking to kind of partner with Transnet, National Ports Authority, to be able to make sure that there, there isn't this kind of blockage? Uh, or potential blockage. I'm not saying that there is there is no export facility yet, but what are the kind of conversations that you're having with Transnet to be able to make sure that once these this product is produced and ready for export, that it's kind of seamless? Yeah. So uh, that goes down to port master planning, port planning, and that is a a, vi a very active space that we're involved in together with. Uh, our project developers, together with key institutions and role players like the CSIR and the research that they've undertaken, and also from a national coordinating perspective through Infrastructure South Africa and, and the Office yes. of Presidency. So I want to, I want to give a, a, a practical example of where we are working with the Port Authority to understand what is the requirement that we all on the public sector side have to do to, to support what um, the business opportunity is. So um, the Office of the Presidency has, uh, in partnership and, and commissioned a study uh, that is being undertaken um, by, by the World Bank uh, in partnership with CSIR, and I'm going to forget <laughs> if I forget everybody involved. But essentially, they're doing a pre-feasibility study to establish what is the storage production and export potential of the green fuels, so like ammonia, methanol, what, from the port of Sultana and the port of Buhu Um And TPA is one of the stakeholders and will also be, be re getting that reporting. And they are part of the um, stakeholder group that, that that is being consulted and being, you know, so there's a feedback loop. So the outcomes of that study will inform decision makers as to what need, what what are the trajectories of the business opportunity? And then how does port planning, SEZ planning? And I want to say that actually the bigger question is the public infrastructure aspect, like water, energy, roads, all of these things, workforce, yeah. you know, um, yeah. that, that would help it. Yeah, so Shahil mentioned um, briefly the the uh, Mokholakwena project, and I mean that's such a cool project because from a water perspective, and noting that obviously Saldana Bay is a water challenged, not starved, mm -hmm. but challenged area, that uh, Mokholakwena is is such a cool project because one's using mine wastewater there for the for the uh, production of um, uh, for the production of hydrogen. Uh, I, and I, forgive me, and I'm just going to mention this. Um, you know, we're great at planning and not so great at execution. So from your lips to mm -hmm. God's ears regarding the port plans, because, I mean, for example, we know 
that LNG import has been on the port plan since 2003, but we're no closer to any import infrastructure. So let's hope that there is a, a proper facilitation. But if I can come back to you then, Thomas, on this point, because and I don't want to ask you to disclose anything around the pre-fees studies that you're doing, because obviously those will be confidential. But to come back to that thumb in the page that I mentioned earlier about you know, the production of green hydrogen, one is aware that, for example, the EU is absolutely insistent that the hydrogen that is imported is absolutely green. So, for example, the energy that is used to produce that hydrogen has to come from a renewable, de demonstrably come from a renewable energy source and not mixed with anything else. So can you talk to, to us a little bit about the ESCOM um, or the DMRE um, preference around islanding and how that fits into this picture? Because, I mean, that's a, that's a key consideration for anybody who's wanting to get involved in this industry and export to a jurisdiction like the EU to make sure that it is produced from a, a completely green resource. At a technical level, there is nothing wrong with islanding. Um, it's, everything is nice and self-contained. And what we Sorry, mean I'm by going island... to, I'm going to interrupt you. Can you explain to was, was, the dumb, lawyer, the there, dumb yes. lawyers like me about what okay. islanding is? And an when you island, it operates in an islanded grid. No electrons cross the boundary. So everything is inside the project. The energy that you need to make the hydrogen, you generate inside the project, and no electricity leaks into the grid, you could say. Um, so that way, if there is a, a very clear wall between your electrical system and the national grid, then it's easy to prove. The downside to this, however, is that um, you will produce hydrogen at a particular cost. The, there are three elements to making hydrogen. You need water. You discussed the element of like, desalination. Unfortunately, the, the, um, the desalination of water is a near negligible cost, benefit, cost area, and we can come back to that particular point. The second area, the electricity must be green, which means solar and wind. The third area is you need an electrolyzer. The electrolyzer takes the electrical energy, passes it through the water um, to separate out the molecules. Now, the capex, the, 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 the electrolyzer is a high capex unit. Do you, to make green hydrogen at lower cost, you want that capex to be well utilized. You want the electrolyzer to run many hours of the year. And how you do that is oversizing your renewables. You produce more wind and more solar than you need. Now, this only works if you can find a market for that excess electricity. If there's no market for that, then you are just generating more capex, but no particular benefit. Now, to return to the island of grid concept, that's not particularly different to the rest of the world. Our competition being Chile, Australia, and so on, generally speaking, have got... Um, uh, Electrical grids, which are robust. Yes. Um, and <laughs> where the supply and the demand are balanced. Let's put it yeah. that way. South Africa has problems, as we know, but it's also an interesting opportunity. Because if we are now producing excess electricity, and we have a system that wants the excess electricity, you can sell that excess electricity. And up until relatively recently, that was not possible. Um, legislation was that you could only sell uh, electricity into the grid um, as a result of the RP, as a result of competitive bidding under the REIPP program, or under a ministerial determination. Since the 100 megawatt cap was lifted, and the uh, electricity is allowed to be wheeled over the grid, at least at a philosophical concept, it is now perfectly possible to sell this renewable electricity to a uh, customer in good financial standing who will sign a long-term PPA. What this does is that the generation of a hydrogen economy may even allow the benefit of the grid in our coastal provinces. We know that the grid is saturated in the Northern Cape. We know that it's close to saturated in the Western Cape. So um, if as part of the stimulating of the green hydrogen economy, we had other actors 
from ESCON, like say provinces or metros, who were prepared to invest in short portions of the electrical grid and investing in um, uh, additional uh, electrical substations, that then becomes nodes around which renewable hydrogen producers can develop and the provinces will get a return on that investment in terms of job creation in, in industrial development and so on. And these can be built on a build operate transfer model so that ESCOM obviously must in the end be um, sole operator of the electrical grid, but they don't have to build every portion of the electrical grid. ESCOM has quite a few problems they're dealing with at the moment, and strengthening the grid in far-flung far provinces is probably not very high on their agenda currently. And that's precisely what we need to get the hydrogen system going. Returning to with the difference between islanded and connected grid, this actually makes an interesting opportunity for South Africa. It means that if you sell that excess hydrogen, uh, so the excess electricity into the grid, you can generate your hydrogen more cheaply than other competing markets that may have better solar and wind. So our, the, 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 the difficulty we face with our grid is actually a strategic asset, an advantage, which can allow us then to get long-term offtake agreements. I hope yeah. that makes sense. No, no, it certainly does make sense. And um, I'll, I'll just ask if anybody has any questions around that, please put those into the Q&A. But if I may just touch base with you on this on this point, Shahil, um, knowing that Angie is is critically involved in, in the development of renewable energy projects around the Southern Africa region, um, how are you dealing with this challenge about, as, as Thomas has said, you know, having to oversize the generator to be able to ensure that you know the electrolyzer and the and the um, the desalinator are always going to be operating, and of course, if you're producing ammonia, the 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 hydrogen conversion into ammonia, that particular part of the kit, that you've always got electrical energy that has to be green. You've always got that on standby. But if you're oversizing, you've got this excess. How are you, as Angie, approaching this? Oh. The approach with a lot of the markets that we are working with in already is that they do have much more liberal markets where there is a merchant market. Now, a merchant market is where we can sell this excess electricity to the grid. So generally, that would be the best way that we would approach this. Um, in, a lot of, uh, in a lot of countries that we are working as well, there, there is a bit of a difference uh, in the makeup of the grid where there is quite a bit of renewable penetration as well. In South Africa itself, I think we are looking at a lot of different projects. And as I mentioned, some of the, uh, the partnerships that we have, like the one with uh, Soldana, we are looking at the entire value chain on what are we going to do with these ele extra electrons um, instead of just decarbonizing the shipping route, as we talked about earlier. Let's uh, decarbonize the onshore portion of this or provide this to the municipalities, which are close by, or any off-taker which uh, requires it. So there are different solutions, and we are looking at all of these uh, across the world in, in, in different forms. Yeah. And I think but if, South if, Africa itself, yeah, that's, what, that's what's going to follow. Okay, but I mean, just listening to what, what Thomas is saying, and obviously um, you know, kind of calling out the elephant that is everybody knows is in the room, and that is you know, grid capacity and the challenges that we have around that. I mean, are you are you looking at then at developing privately or in conjunction with ESCOM a privately um, sponsored or um, uh, uh, what's the word financed um, grid to be able to export your electrons from where your generators are to where you need them? So, I think within the South African context, I don't think having these islanded uh, projects make a lot of sense. And I think there is going to be some sort of agreement that we'll have to come up with, with ESCOM to either pass the assets on or sell it to ESCOM. I think uh, right now the feasibility studies are looking at this and none of the feasibility studies that I have seen have looked at a pure islanded solution uh, within the South African context. Okay, well, that's, that's really interesting. Um, and if I can then just... Uh, Cut across to you again, Ugo, on on the basis of you know what we're dealing with, and, and you have mentioned is a, a highly volatile substance, 
um, and that, uh, you know, the health and safety aspects around dealing with such a hazardous material are absolutely key. Is there anything in the regulatory framework that we presently have in South Africa that you as a Stahl would like to see either um, strengthened or changed um, that could facilitate this clearly what is um, is anticipated as a, a, a very important resource? I think at the first, um, if you have some um, um, new applications, um, example, at first, the health risks, uh, it's important uh, to see uh, the site, the environmental hazard and the storage of transportation uh, combined of everything. I think um, for the hydrogen market, it is very important uh, to declare this at first um, with example, this uh, direction of style or this direction of uh, uh, safety. Um, when you handle this hydrogen as it is or, or amine or methanol, and I think that it is first uh, things that you uh, declare the first uh, steps for uh, the implemented applications. Yeah, and just picking up on that then, uh, Kashifa, is this is this a particular um, area of um, of concern for for the um, industrial development zones? Or what 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 sort of uh, initiatives are the IDZs following to make sure that you know, what is ever developed within the IDZ is completely safe? Mm. Yeah, I think we're going to have to be guided by regulations. Um, mm. and, 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 and processes. I mean, we've got NEMA. We've, we've got, uh, project developers have to do, I mean, have, have to seek environmental authorizations and they have to go through a process where illicit activity. And I mean, that is, I want to say that in my experience, in my view, that process is ironclad about identifying what the risks are, giving project developers an opportunity to assess and how to mitigate and how to um, respond to the concerns, public engagement and feedback. Uh, I think that that is going to have to be implicit. I mean, that is implicit in, in the way that we work with the project developers. It's like, okay, so yeah. your project is going to need an EIA looking just at the headline activities you want to do. And we can help facilitate your project development team, your environmental authorization practitioner meeting with the authorities but you know that is a clear um, process i want to say yeah there's clarity on the roles and responsibilities and also yeah. opportunities for input so i mean i think and but i think the that's that's a good well-known space but i think what is coming up in our um work with project developers and the local authority is okay so then the question of the municipal bylaws and the yeah. municipal because if you think of like um disaster management regulations they depending on the municipalities and the levels and whatnot they you know the municipality has a as a role to play in disaster management you know fire stations and all of that and the district municipality so in these new areas where this new economy is going to be how are we making sure that the other role players, the sub-national role players, are capacitated with the understanding of what green hydrogen is and its all its derivatives, of its handling, of its production, and the business case, and the the uh, the environmental and the um the safety the case. And then is, is the system sorry, sorry, lastly? So, but they're going to have to be capacitated, and there's going to have to be an element of public investment in new resources. For the district, for the for the local authorities, and and that one well understands because, as you say, then the local authorities do need to be capacitated from this perspective. And I mean, one is aware in 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 other sectors. I mean, just dealing with gas pipelines, um, for example, how critical it is to engage with the municipality and its and its fire protection services to make sure that one gets the correct sign offs. Um, and the question that I wanted to ask you more pertinently in this regard is do you see your role as kind of holding the the developer's hand in walking them through this process or do you kind of say well you know it's up to you to find out and do i think we have to i think that's the job that we have 
I mean, before green hydrogen came, <laughs> you know, yes. uh, and and whether it's an international or South African company or partnerships or JVs, I mean, it's it's quite clear if you look at like uh, trends nationally in investment and um, trade and investment tracking. Walking that journey is so important to build the relationship and the trust and the understanding of like what it is that the 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 country is expecting of you at at the national and the subnational level as an investor and what you can put forward um i just wanted to say like uh, uh, and and uh, just uh, a thought sprung to mind now when we were talking about all the shik and, and all of that and the capacitating uh, capacitation of the local authority so that is actually also one thing that we are facilitating yeah. so um Working because there's a lot of programs on the way, and you know, um, from the HISA and from programs like under the GIZ uh, uh, yeah. framework. So there is scope with all of these programs under the green hydrogen kind of banner, where you can ask. So okay, so you're you're promoting green hydrogen, but do you have a course that we can take the local authorities through, the relevant town planners? Uh, the dot disaster management managers about like what to expect and hide green hydrogen 101 and then going deeper with like maybe the the national cleaner production center that that sits in CSIR to so say okay so how does your system actually um, vet building plans or pipeline submissions yeah, or yeah. anything like that or yeah. or like what is the standard operating procedure if there is a fire you know or that kind of thing. So, so we are facilitate. Those, we're, we're at the beginning yeah. stages of it. Yeah. So we, I mean, that that deals with kind of the interaction with um, with authorities that that may have may be interested and affected. Um, but and without mentioning the war and certainly not naming any names or embarrassing anybody. But um, uh, how involved are the IDZs in in interfacing the developer with local communities to make sure that there's proper consultation because we know that that's becoming the real key topic when you're dealing with environmental authorization is to what extent have the local communities and other interested affected parties either directly or inter indirectly have been engaged with on a yeah on a yeah a reasonable and prudent but proper basis how involved are you with that sorry i was on mute i, I think we we've very involved. The challenge is, I think in South Africa, and like you said, we're good at, we, we have very good planning methodologies and, and, and we have not fulfilled and followed through on execution, um, as well as we should as a country now, I'm saying. So for us who is in the thick of it, it really becomes a very kind of responsibility question of you you have project developers who are working on a thing that you know can change the fabric of that society and economy and that there are, you know, things that are going to have to be addressed and discussed, yes. you know. It's not all rosy. Um, but then when do you have that discussion when the, the business case is still being established? You know, you, you don't, and, and also you might still have regulatory reforms coming to place that, and, and studies being done that change things. So that is a, a constant discussion that we're having. So what we do is we work with the project developers. We introduce project developers to the officials, uh, and, and so that they understand that this is a project that is on a journey. And this is an ask questions, change inf yes. exchange information that is n not um, propriety or due to a confidentiality um, clause. Because also you can't give the information to officials and tell them, but you can't tell anybody else. Because that is exactly <laughs> what their role is, right? That's their job. So yes. you don't want to set them up in that, you know, thinking like, what am I getting involved in? And this, this is that sounds dubious, you know, like we don't want that in South Africa. So, yeah. it, so th and then when, 
at a certain, then we discuss what is the point where we actually have like public consultations. And I want to say that the public consultation element needs to come through a regulated process so that everybody is clear on what their rights are and what their responsibilities yes. are. It can't just be yes. a PR exercise because then who, who do you hold accountable after you've had the town hall? So, I, so I guess the the regulated process is the is the um, is the environmental leg legislation framework. But Thomas, you've got your hand up, and I wanted to circle back to you anyway um, because I wanted to ask you in the feasibility studies, and without again disclosing uh, confidential information, to what extent are those feasibility studies concentrating on the very issues we've just been talking about? Um, I wanted to uh, just uh, mention that um, uh, Kashif had raised an exceptionally uh, important question. Um, and there has been some prior work in this in the Eastern Cape uh, provincial government, um, where Alistair McMaster has done some prior work. He, he sits within that provincial government department and identified... Uh, not even talking about hydrogen, just talking about uh, green uh, electricity production. You have a, a, um, a social psychology that kicks in where you have um, um, public service uh, uh, officials who are honest, hardworking people. They're just trying to do their job. They watch TV like the rest of us. They see what happens with, uh, with the Zondo Commission. Uh, they, they are terrified of making a mistake. And when you're in an area that you don't fully understand, that you don't understand the consequences, uh, and you don't fully, and no one has really explained to you um, what the various implications are, the logical consequences that you do nothing. And that then means projects don't progress and there is delay. Um, and that gives frustration on all sides. And then you think it is... Um, and I don't mean to be unkind, uh, it, uh, people tend to ascribe this to incompetence, and that may not be fair. It might just be just normal, very rational fear um, and not really understanding uh, what is required. So he has taken, uh, this is now Alistair McMaster, uh, an interesting process of designing a long flowchart where um, all the different steps, approvals uh, that need to be taken are available in visible form and this is then um, uh, processed through these officials to go and say, you sit here. The decisions that you influence are in this domain. If there's a blockage here, this affects something here and X billion rand worth of investment and so many people have their jobs and whatever. And while it may look scary, your role is to approve this according to this uh, authority which is delegated to you, which requires you evaluating these areas. It demystifies the approval process and then uh, gets greater buy-in at the public sector. And I think something similar to this is required further down the value chain with hydrogen production as well. So um, uh, it really begins at a, 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 a discussion which is held um, with uh, uh, municipal authorities, provincial authorities, um, uh, and uh, all the various uh, entities in that chain where you are allowed to ask questions. No one is going to question your, 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 your bona fides or your, or your competence. We are all learning in this together. It's a new industry. And by creating this, this uh, freedom to ask questions, we will all move further faster. Otherwise, there's a conspiracy of silence and then things don't move. So let me ask you the question, though. I mean, you raise a, a, a really important point, which is obviously building on what, what uh, Kashif was saying. But so if there's a capacity issue and an, you know, um, and, and an, uh, an ability or skills issue, are there, there organizations there who are actually actively driving this capacity building so that you know, the, the officials who are charged with having to deal with these very complex and socially pregnant issues um, are, have, have the, the confidence, let alone the skill, but the confidence to be able to deal with it on, a, on an informed basis and also on a basis that say, you know what, I've applied my mind and, you know, if somebody wants to take me on review to a court, like 
seems to be happening on a regular basis. At least that I'm uh, the proposition that I've put forward or the reasoning I put forward is defensible. So are there those organizations who are actually helping build these kinds of capacities? Because without that, it seems to me that, you know, we can plan till we're blue in the face on this mm -hmm. wonderful industry, but we're going to fall at the first hurdle. I think there are some. I don't think that there is enough. And I think that uh, we, this is something we need to engage with more robustly. Uh, Kashifa mentioned the NCPC. The National Cleaner Production Center is a hosted program at CSR. They report directly to the Department of Trade, Industry, and Competition, and they are resourced by them. Their mandate up until quite recently was to enable industry to become more resource efficient, energy efficient, circular economy, management of waste, and their mandate has now been augmented by green hydrogen. One of the things which they do, besides organizing audits of energy audits and companies, is creating and generating um, uh, skills development uh, activities. These are not in competition with SACWA authorities, the South African Qualifications Authority. It's not um, competing with universities, technicons, uh, TVET colleges. What it does do is uh, provide uh, in-service training at um, uh, 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 institutions where from the artisan right through to the, the CEO get to understand this thing called the green hydrogen economy. Um, but I don't believe we have the equivalent for the public sector as yet. I stand to be corrected, but it is certainly worth exploring more. Then if we can just take it from a, a little step further, uh, Shail, if I can um, just ask you this. So we talked about the question of partnerships, um, and in, in this particular context, the partnership of organizations building capacity within the authorities to be able to deal with these thorny issues. But I mean, how important are the partnerships or are they important? Are partnerships important in the development of a, of a hydrogen or green hydrogen project? Uh, it, it strikes me that um, this can't be done simply by one organization on its own. Um, partnerships are definitely key to enabling and unlocking the value that we require at scale. And NG is very much... Um, looking at these partnerships as very important, especially in the South African context. I've mentioned quite a few times the Green Iron Ore Corridor, but we are working on another project called Rainbow, which, uh, which we are working with uh, companies, big companies uh, in South Africa, such as Anglo-American, Total, uh, Sasol. And by looking at these problems together, that's how we are going to find the solution. Uh, the cl climate crisis is not going to go away, yeah. and the green hydrogen economy is something that we believe has will play a part in alleviating the problems of climate change. And okay. Let, sorry, I'm interrupting you. Well, I was going to no, ask continue. you, and yep. forgive forgive me, um, but as you were talking, I was just thinking about this yep. question of partnerships and also the the issue around capacity building. And you've mentioned obviously the big main players in the industry who are obviously going to and need to lead the charge in development of this nascent industry. But is there any space for, you know, the smaller black owned type company to be able to involve, be involved in projects of this nature, even if it's from the ground up, you know, question of skills and knowledge and capacity immediately spring to mind, but also financial standing and ability to be able to participate. Can space be made for the smaller player? I think uh, there's definitely space uh, for players across the board uh, in the hydrogen industry. I think um, if you have to look at the successful programs in South Africa, like the renewable energy, um, the REAP program, there has been a lot of success stories coming out of that. And some of the developers there, uh, such as the Prisca project, is, is from somebody who's been a big um, investor in the renewable energy program. And they've you know, come up from the bottom, uh, bottom up and created a program which 
is going to create hydrogen ammonia for use both locally and internationally. So we have already have these examples within the country. I think the, the possibility of green hydrogen means that there will be place for the smaller players and the bigger players um, on a localized scale. Once we get to that point where it makes sense, you may have these uh, local companies doing this in rural KZN or Eastern Cape, but there still is space for us looking at these massive projects using the IDZs to uh, send these over internationally. Um, I think we need to also talk about the skills that we've built up with these other programs and how important these are going to be with building the infrastructure uh, at the scales that we that we yeah. require. I think we've we've touched on the electrical uh, infrastructure in terms of like the grid and the renewable energy project, solar, wind. You have all these construction companies there. They they currently are building these projects on the ground. They are going to be the ones who are going to be building this. So yeah. there they, they definitely is enough space for everyone. Here. That's that's well understood. And yeah, I think that, uh, that certainly opportunities lie in the energy production side, the electrical energy production side for the smaller player. Can I just ask you, though, I mean, we have been kind of mentioning the big pumper projects like um, like Bukhubai and uh, and the green ammonia project in, in Kucha. Um, uh, what's been your experience in the more sort of catalytic um hydrogen projects you know the kind of smaller for local consumption because uh um there is a question in the q a and i'm anticipating the q a which we'll get to in a second but um you know, the question is besides export of h2 in the form of ammonia obviously because that's the most practical way of exporting can green hydrogen be produced to be commercially used locally Um, as, as a large international company, we, we generally are looking at the bigger projects, but uh, on a personal side, I've obviously come across some projects. Um, I came across a project in Durban where they uh, have basically taken an engine and make this run on hydrogen. You take a 500 milliliter uh, water bottle and just plug it in, you can drive to Johannesburg. So I think there's a lot of innovation and a lot of uh, these tinkering projects which we are looking at. Of course, these don't make the press, uh, but they are out there. And they don't get the funding. Yeah, <laughs> I think <laughs> that's, um, that's a bit of a I challenge. Think, and there's nobody really on the panel that can answer that question. Uh, we ideally would have had a, a, a lender on the panel to be able to challenge there. But um, it just seems to me that the catalytic projects um, uh, have some real challenges around you know, access to funding. Because there's some, as you say, that, that project in Durban is such a cool project. But my goodness me, to make it sustainable, it needs, it needs financial support. I think, um, um, I think on, on that, it's, it's the same as uh, how do you fund a 200 megawatt wind farm compared to putting up a solar panel on your roof. It's, you know, the funding gap is there, but there are players in the market who are willing to take this up. And I think yeah. uh, having a good strategy on the government level, which is there in which, which which is there and is being developed further, I think this is this is what's going to unlock this hydrogen value chain, as you say, especially on the mm. on the smaller. So, so maybe we need a small hydrogen program. <laughs> um, Kashif, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I was, was going to add from the financing side. So what we are learning and seeing from our project developers is that there's this. Financing requires offtake, <laughs> the, the, and 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 offtake agreements. Uh, everyone is in this kind of like the, it's, it's an interesting discourse because some some countries or some offtakers or some some funders to say like don't bring me a pilot project because they want the bigger scale. But the big scale is so heady to do and it's long, right? And there's complexities and. So I think it's it's it it is a bit of a um you gotta find a partner that understands your context. Uh and we will help facilitate that as all the SEZs do. Okay. Uh, but because what we can what the other benefit that we have is that we can aggregate the demand and say like you need to maybe start looking at this region because there are five or six project developers. 
who, if you aggregate them, you can unlock this socioeconomic uh, value, right? So can you start dealing with these five or six project developers and really build a relationship with them? Some of them might be pilots, some of them, but a pilot is for something that will um, grow, you know. Um, I, I, I think that when it comes to financing, um, I think just, just me be more pragmatic. I think we do have to, we, we have to, we have to show proof of concept and, and that become and something that's palatable and where the risk is more better known. And that's, so, I want to say that we can do in a year, right? So that's a pilot project. Uh, so, so, let's so if I'm, you know, yeah. so I'm, I beg your pardon, I'm interrupting you. Um, if if I could just ask you this, okay? So, I mean, aren't the big projects themselves pilot projects? Because yeah, nothing <laughs> nothing has been done at this the scale here yet. Yeah. So, I'm yeah. just interested to understand the kind of interface and cooperation between, for example, projects which may be cited um, and developed in Saldana as opposed to or in connection with or in competition with a major project a, a couple of hundred kilometers north of you. At <laughs> so, I mean, I can, I can talk about it. Um, so, because it was published and, you know, so Sassel have signed a, uh, an MOU with the Northern Cape government to advance yes. uh, and, and um, their interests in Buchweisberg, right, as a producer there and... Um, of green hydrogen and derivatives. They've also signed with us a, an, an, an MOU to a green hydrogen project in Saldana, and they've also signed a joint development agreement with Arcelimital, because essentially, on, on simplicity, is Sasol will produce the molecule and it will yes. be off take into uh, Arcelimital to restart the steel mill. And okay. then produce green, green iron, uh, green steel, uh, you know, on, on, on that basis. That's all are, are quite clear that they have actually, they see, if you look at their strategy and their communications, they see the map of South Africa as their market and beyond it. Yes. And that's okay. Because I think if you take the view that green hydrogen and its derivatives is the molecule and of the future for different industries, you do actually need the molecule to be produced at a cost-effective scale everywhere, uh, or, or where it's applicable. You know, I'm not saying yeah, yes. everywhere. Like there needs to be like a business sense uh, behind it. So, and 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 the differences. That, and we've also, as the not we, but um, the Western Cape government has signed a heads of agreement with the Northern Cape government. Because we see that we can be oh, that's interesting. complementary actually to each other. Because we have a port and a SEZ that is operational, right? So Saldana can be like your test case of what does it take to produce a green molecule and decarbonize the port, restart ArcelorMittal, um, maybe even, you know, export at, at like as a new bunker fuel, you know, um, and, and so forth and so forth and so forth. Uh, yes. While the Bukobai is like Greenfield, it's it's new and its markets are different and at a bigger scale than Saldana because Saldana has the constraint of there's towns around it and you know uh, it's 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 not Greenfield. Yeah. So there's going to be a limit in Saldana, but eventually, right? But that's okay. Um, yes. But I mean, I think what, and what I'm hearing you say, and, and it's something very interesting because I'm not sure many people are aware of it, is that, that Saldana and, and, and Buhubai are not potential competitors because they've got different markets. And whilst, and whilst Saldana may be more, I hesitate to use the word parochial, more internally um, focused, Buhubai is clearly an export type project. Um, and the only thing that I wanted to quickly touch base on with you, Thomas, if you could possibly answer this before we get into the Q&A is you mentioned earlier that, um, and this actually speaks to a, a, um, a point that Kashifa made about, you know, a, a, a confirmed off-taker. Mm. 
and that which is critical for the sustainability of yes. of this kind of project. We know that, for example, the Namibian project has, in inverted commas, a confirmed offtaker, and that's what that's what makes the project sustainable. But I'm coming back to the point that you made earlier: is that you know there may be other jurisdictions that are able to produce hydrogen and do it quicker than we are. But what is long term in accounts to our favor is the fact that we can produce the energy at a much more cost competitive and the, the ultimate product at a much more cost competitive um, rate. And that means even though we may not be first mover, doesn't necessarily m- mean that we miss the market. Um, uh, close. Uh, uh, what, what I'm essentially saying is that we've got a uh, uh, very good sun and remarkably good wind. Um, and we are far from some of our markets, not as far as Australia. Yeah. Um, so that means that uh, S- Saudi Arabia is better placed than we are. Um, they can, uh, their, their, their transport costs are significantly less. They can move things by pipeline. Uh, similarly, Morocco. Um, so what is our competitive advantage? Now, because we can sell the excess electricity to the grid, even if our solar uh, resource is comparable, and even if they may have a better wind resource than us, we might still produce the molecule cheaper. Yeah. Because what is Saudi Arabia going to do with this excess electricity? Yes. What is Morocco yes. going to do with the excess electricity? I can tell you what South Africa will do with the excess electricity. <laughs> Um, and this Dumping. now means that that excess electricity, it, you don't even necessarily have to sell it at a profit. You sell the electricity at cost. Yes. Because selling it at cost is a lot better than curtailing it. Yes. And because yes. this electricity will be intermittent, right? Yes. So therefore, if you're a metro, why would you pay top dollar for electricity that's going to be intermittent. So therefore, yeah, the yeah. metro wins because it's at lower cost. Uh, if you are, say, the Cape Town metro, you can use to pump up the, 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 the pump storage scheme, which then gives greater energy security to the whole region. Um, and there are other benefits that come into play. Um, I mentioned water a little bit earlier. Um, yeah. the desalination is an expensive water uh, uh, source. And it's too expensive for agriculture. It's too expensive for poor communities. But it, the cost of desalination is practically negligible for the hydrogen producer um, because it, the, the costs are dwarfed by the other costs, which means if anyone can afford to build a desalination plant, a hydrogen producer can, which means you can therefore make it as a, um, a social license to operate that the desalination plant is oversized. Now, if you are city of Cape Town and you're building a desalination plant for evolutionary expansion, then you know that water will be bought. If you're building a desalination plant for water security as a result of climate change or as a result of intermittent droughts, that's a much harder proposition. And we can see this was faced by Western Australia. It was faced by by California. Um, But if you make use of uh, uh, your, your water security desalination Um, on the back of your hydrogen infrastructure, the hydrogen uh, plant doesn't, the the hydrogen cost is not significantly more in the order of one or 2% more, not much more. Um, You build better um, buy-in from public stakeholders and from communities, and then it becomes a win-win situation all around. There are multiple Uh, linkages that that make it interesting. Thanks. Um I'm afraid I'm just uh, having an inverter problem myself, so apologies for any beeping noise you may hear in the background. But I'm going to to quickly segue into a a question just on this point, um, Thomas, that is in the Q&A, is um, uh, one of the participants asked the question, how do you manage intermittent power supply from renewables with hydrogen production process which requires 24-7 power to be efficient? Right. you don't need 24-7 power, but 24-7 power will certainly make your hydrogen cheaper. Your issue here is that the electricity that you make from solar and wind is going to be cheaper than electricity from the grid. What kills you is that your electrolyzer is expensive. So what you would use is solar and wind together. This means that your, your, sun, your sun shines every day. It may not shine well, but it certainly shines. 
which means that your, your, your minimum production uh, in every day of the year is non-zero in good zero, in good areas. And we have the data to show that. This is not true for wind. Your minimum wind is zero, which means that if you have solar and wind together by day, you can design a system that's running at near 80% capacity factor. By night, you can be running in the order of 25%, 30% capacity factor. So this together means that your electrolyzer has enough full load hours over the year. Uh, that's a technical term implying the, 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 the rate at which it is used over the year, which means that your hydrogen costs can then come down. Where things get interesting is, let's say you take that hydrogen and you need to make ammonia. Ammonia plants do not like cycling up and down, although an electrolyzer can handle that within limits. And there you must take additional uh, um, uh, steps. You want a hydrogen storage buffer so that the, the, the ammonia plant can run close to 24-7. It still won't run 100% 24-7. Um, and the hydrogen supply is there. And you would want your electricity to be guaranteed, so you probably want a bit of a battery in there as well. But the energy requirement for making ammonia is dwarfed by the energy requirement for the electrolyzer. So and, and when you look at your total economics, that's not a, a, a particularly heavy lift. I hope that makes sense. Thanks, Thomas. It looks like, unfortunately, um, Matt has dropped off quickly. Um, we'll see if he comes back on. In the meantime, I'm just going to carry on then with the Q&A while we wait for him to join. Um, I'm just going to start at the top because I'm not the expert here. So, oh, there, Matt is back. Matt, My apologies. Sorry, I had, oh, no. I had an inverter failure, but at least I have redundancy backup. No problem. Can Over you hear you. me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I, I just would need to quickly check what the, the next question is in the, in the Q&A. Thank you, Thomas, for the answer, which I didn't completely hear. Um, but let me just quickly check here. Um, so there was a question about renewable energy certificates, uh, the TREX system under REXA, which I'm not sure everybody is aware of. Perhaps I can give a little bit of background for those who who are not informed by this. Um, a tradable renewable energy certificate is one that is issued by um, by this organisation called the Renewable Energy Council of uh, South Africa, or oh, I think it's Council. I forget. And uh, it effectively certifies that energy produced by a renewable energy um, uh, facility is green. And uh, typically, um, uh, we find in the market that the buyer of the electrons is the one who um, receives that uh, renewable energy certificate, which is then able to be used as a green credit in various forms. The question is, or question posed in the q and is, can't a renewable energy certificate be sufficient to demonstrate that the energy used in the production of the hydrogen slash ammonia is clean and green. Um, and is there anybody in the panel who can answer the question, um, in particular in relation to um, how the um, European Union approaches this, whether a renewable energy certificate will be sufficient to demonstrate uh, green compliance or whether we're going to have to have some kind of islanded solution? Can anybody in the panel venture an answer? Sahil, Sahil, do you want to go first? You, you can go first, uh, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give it a stab and say that philosophically, there's no problem why, or there's no reason why renewable certificates should not work. Uh, the problems can be more mundane and boring however, in the sense that you want your electrolyzer to run for a good number of hours. So you want to have a, a bit of control of the energy supply that comes into it. Um, unless you've got a, a long-term agreement with a supplier elsewhere. Um, so you are a large electrolyzer housed in port A, and there is a large wind farm 
uh, at site B and you are buying all of their power by a traded certificate, then you have an idea of the, your, 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 your power uh, per hour, so to speak. But generally speaking, on a, on a spot trading system in the South African environment with low renewable penetration, that could be problematic. Um, the, the Delegated Act of the European Union, which I'm not 100% up on, but uh, my understanding was that the, the European Union, in, uh, initially the proposal of the Council was that the, there had to be spatial and temporal correlation for the electricity produced. Um, and initially, everyone was hung up on the definition of spatial and temporal. Um, this delegated act was challenged by the European Parliament, um, who felt this was too onerous, and the, um, the temporal correlation was relaxed to uh, where the electricity is supplied per quarter of the year compared to per hour. Now, my understanding was that that was the, 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 the state of affairs um, but the intent is still to return to spatial, a, a temporal correlation within an hour. But the spatial correlation theoretically means it's got to be co-located. But in the European Union, this is not true. Uh, 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 co-located just means in the same generating area. Now, Sweden has something like uh, uh, seven of these generating areas. And France, the whole country, is one. So you could generate in Perpignan and have an electrolyzer in Dunkirk and you are still um, uh, compliant. So um, uh, I'm at this point, I'll happily hand over to Shahil because I'm quite sure he will be able to explain <laughs> better than I did. Shahil, over to you. Uh, I think you have a better understanding of the EU regulations, but um, I was just wanted to talk about the opportunities with regards to this. I think utilizing the scheme means that you can... <laughs> use the best resource which typically would be the northern cape for solar and uh, the coastal areas for wind to power your electrolyzer which would be located at one of the ports uh, strategic ports or even one of the ports that we haven't uh, spoken about it just allows for this hydrogen economy to kind of touch the entire country rather than uh, being concentrated in very very specific areas and i think if we do utilize systems like this and the EU is happy with this or any other uh, regulatory body, maybe in Asia or North America, that would be great for, for the country. Uga, as a, as a, a member of the EU, have you um, any observations or comments on this? I think it's a nine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm here. <laughs> um, no problem. No, um, we see as in, in example, and uh, we see so um, when we talk about EU, we see um, so many projects, uh, example in, in, in this area, and uh, like uh, grow from example to uh, you build a euro in 22 to. Um, uh, 2030 by by 15 million uh, billion of euros and they are planning example of uh, 40 gigawatt of electrolyzing capacities by 2030 and i think it's uh, very important to declare here um, how they will work or regenerate this uh, this terms and how they want to uh, reach the goal and i think here is uh, important to work with different solutions like wind uh, or onshore and 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 uh, solar systems and it is very important to understand um, when you put these technologies uh, the um, you work with uh, here with a with a with a government together with a uh, safety hazardous areas etc you will implement everything and uh, show to the right way to um, um, to realize this big project Okay, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Ogu. That's, um, that's really beneficial. Can I ask you this, um, Thomas, if I may, to circle back to a question around water? Um, you have, you have mentioned some of the, some of the issues and constraints. Um, uh, but the question that's raised is, 
Can you actually comment on the actual water requirements, in particular the purity of water that is required for H2 production? This is a function. Um, you, you need demineralized water in electrolyzers. And so you are, in any case, if you're using fresh water, surface water, which I would not recommend, uh, because we are uh, a water stressed country and so on. But even then, you need to demineralize that water before it goes into the electrolyzer plant. So um, you are going to have to treat that water anyway. So if your upstream supply is a desalination plant, um, uh, you are going to end up with a, a, a water supply that's in the order, and I, um, I believe it's 50, 50 ppm, for, for a, 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 um, a reverse osmosis system um, and significantly lower for a thermal desalination system. But in any case, that will then proceed to a demineralization plant before it goes towards the electrolyzer. Mm. I, I, I could just say from my um, hard experience in a thermal plant that the demon water process there is still key even if the benchmark is lower than what you may require for h2 production <laughs> but it's still there um but that actually brings to an, another question that's been asked in the q a and and to show you maybe you can answer this because of angie's involvement in the mahala Quina project uh, the the participant has asked the question can you unpack a little bit just from a an interest perspective how that mine wastewater is actually used to be able to produce the hydrogen in the in the simplest way i think it's it's exactly what thomas has just uh, spoken about you are going to purify the water in specific ways i think uh, using mine water there are other chemicals in it but uh, it's it's just a different process at the end of the day uh, you you are going to have that demineralization stage right at the end I think uh, the quality of water does have a slight effect, but again, as Thomas has said before, the, the desalination slash demineralization process is not the biggest driver of the cost of hydrogen. No, sure. I, 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 mean, I just think I think the question is more from an interest perspective of uh, how it actually works. So, um, are you saying though that, at, for example, at Mahalakwena, where the the wastewater is, is it scrubbed of the of the of the other chemicals, or is it just you know it's it goes through some initial process, then through a demon plant, and then into the electrolyzer? I'm. Uh... I'm not too sure about the exact uh, chemistry okay. of this. <laughs> I can get my chemist to check on this. Provide an okay, you, you uh, I would imagine you, I would imagine you probably are going to have um, uh, sand filtration upstream, possibly ultrafiltration, uh, moving on to a reverse osmosis, uh, osmosis step. Um, but you're not dealing with seawater level contamination no, at 35,000 exactly. yeah. parts per million. Um, yeah. I would imagine mine water, and again, I stand to be corrected, is in the order of 3,000 parts per million, close to, to, closer to brackish water. Um, yes. But the, the principle remains the same. It just means that your, 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 your filters get clogged uh, less frequently uh, and so on. But you have to worry about hardness. You have to worry about um, uh, things of that nature. But this is um, – uh, well understood, uh, and there's is is best practice. The the professionals know what they're doing. It's not uh, there's nothing new here. This is uh, uh, this is understood. Yeah. Okay. Understood. Thank you, Tom. There's a question in the um, in the Q and A, and I'm going to leave it open to the panel to one of you to stick up your hand to answer this. Um, and maybe it's you, Thomas, again, because it does go to feasibility. How feasible is it in the shorter term to develop hydrogen projects that integrate sustainable development metrics or the needs of more marginalized communities versus projects priority, prioritizing decarb and export? So question of feasibility and sustainability. Okay. Um, the... The, the uh, sustainability, uh, particularly social sustainability, is uh, remarkably important. Um, you would think that it is in contrast to um, uh, the, the economic opportunity, but here you need to understand who is the customer. 
if you yeah. are selling the water to or it's selling the hydrogen to a local user in an industrial plant, then it's up to the, the ethics and policies of that plant. If you're yeah. selling it to Germany, however, it's a whole new ballgame. The German national hydrogen strategy has got a whole number of elements. For example, um, the renewable electricity you use to make the hydrogen may not result in a decrease in the renewable energy available to the country. So it must be additional. Um, you may not, therefore, as a result of making uh, the hydrogen, uh, be dispossessing any communities. You must not. Uh, and, and these are all clear. So if you do not qualify, you don't have a market. Germans aren't going to buy it. So therefore, it becomes an economic argument to get your sustainability right. Also, you're operating in the South African context. So you need operating licenses. You are dealing with various regulatory authorities. You're dealing with politicians. And, and in the South African environment, you're going to struggle to do a large-scale plant without taking sustainability, economics, and so on into effect. Um, because if your community is against you, if your province is against you, um, if your government is against you, you are going to struggle. Thanks, Thomas. Hey, Kashifi, you had your hand up? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I wanted to just uh, echo what, what Thomas said. Like, it's actually quite interesting because in these discussions, that is actually up front and center. It, 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 it's part and parcel of the project definition. It's like, okay, so what is our sustainability approach and a plan? Yes. Yes, I mean, I mean that's 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 an important point because aren't, don't we find that in fact across the sectors, irrespective of the technology and 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 the particular procurement, sustainability and um, and uh, you know equitable participation in these projects is absolutely key. I mean, otherwise you run the risk of having your plant burnt down, for example. Um, you know, you've got to take communities by the hand and yes. walk the road with them. And that's, an, you know, perhaps a, an element that is not paid sufficient attention to outside of the formal procurements. Um, um, it's, it's, it's not to say that we've got it 100% right in South Africa. Yeah. I'm, I'm not claiming we are brilliant, um, but uh, it is not unknown. For example, under the REIPPP, uh, there are communities that, uh, uh, that, that, that state that they were not sufficiently engaged. So this is an, uh, a, a, a loop Hopefully, it's a closed loop with actual feedback, yes. and there's actual learning that happens. Um, and that was for electricity supply. But the electricity yes. supply was for the grid. And therefore, um, you would have certain uh, requirements in the South African framework to go and make this work. Sure. You're only dealing with South African uh, uh, stakeholders. When you are selling to the European Union, and particularly to Germany, um, just to get your contract, you have to go and show all these elements. Your environmental impact assessment isn't just, are you destroying some the habitat of a, of a desert turtle or something? You are also saying, are you violating sacred spaces? Are you um, uh, uh, marginalizing communities? Are you doing all these different things? It's, it's actually part of that study. Yeah, thanks, Thomas. I think that that's, that's an important point to make. And, you know, we, we are operating in the South African context and that we have a certain framework that we need to, to give effect to, irrespective of what the requirements may be for your ultimate or from your ultimate end user or the jurisdiction in which your ultimate end user um, resides. So, I mean, it's important to bear this in mind is that, um, you know, we have a certain framework in this country and it needs to be given effect to. Um, and you know, I asked the question about the smaller player on an advised basis, because, you know, um, if we if we don't take communities and players who are not necessarily the big players in the market, if we don't take them in hand and walk the road with them, then, you know, there are going to be ultimate challenges way down the line, which kind of you will wipe your eyes out and say, well, what was that about? And say, well, you should have paid attention to this. Five years ago, um, we've we've kind of reached the end of the questions that are are in the um, the Q and A. So I'm going to ask all of the participants. Oh, sorry, Kashifa, you have your hand up. Sorry, yeah. I'm, I mean, it, it, the 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 question of local players and participation in this is is, is coming through in the in the the Q and A and and in the chat, as you said now. And I think that 
I want to say that there's a lot of work that is being done by the CETA on understanding the value chain for the skills that are going to be required at a massive scale. But also I want to say that we do have a hydrogen economy. It's just, I mean, it's, it's, it's only in certain places and maybe us in the Western Cape don't know anything about it because it's up in Secunda or, or, or you know what I mean? So it's, we mustn't think that nothing's happening or that there isn't uh, uh, policies in place for the handling and permitting of hydrogen as a, as a, as a molecule as it is now, right? So, but, so I want to say on the, on the local player and, and I think what you're, what we all know in South Africa is about equity, equality and transformation. Yeah. And so the CETAs are doing quite a lot of work, especially the chemical CETA, right? I mean, it's, it's the, this is their market on uh, the skills value chain analysis for this. Now, that is on the individual level. But if you think about then going into entrepreneurship and, 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 and local players and small opportunities, opportunities for smaller players, right. put it that way, then we need to support the CETAs in their skills development work and in their programs because that will impact the opportunities for uh, um, uh, players at the small level. So I, th I think I'm keen to see the other thing I want to say is um, the green hydrogen commercialization strategy that was worked on and published by the IDC, but it was worked on with the DTIC. So the comment period has closed now and the teams are busy addressing the comments that were raised. And, and I'm sure that the localization, the manufacturing and all of that and upstream downstream opportunities is part of those comments that, and that, that, uh, um, were submitted. So I'm keen to see what that strategy looks like after the comments. And I think that we need to, on platforms like this, actually make sure that we communicate what those strategies are saying uh, to the relevant um, audiences. Yeah. I think that's such an important point, the communication, because if we're not communicating, then people feel left behind. And then the only way to 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 um, ventilate their frustration or their you know, exercise their participation is to make noise. And, you know, we want to facilitate the process, not to um, not to have it full of roadblocks and interruptions. Uh, thanks for that, Kashifa. I'm going to take that. You, you'll forgive me as a reformed litigator. I'm going to take that as your final submission, and I'm going to ask the rest of the participants to uh, or panelists to make their final submissions before I adjourn and take this under advisement. So, do any of you um, have any final comments, Thomas? I'll give a quick. I'll give a quick comment here and say that. Um, there's been a lot of talk about hydrogen, and the, the issue is hydrogen is a, uh, a commodity which um, has value depending on the local market which exists. So if the very green market is in Germany, then you've got to be very compliant and get it to Germany. An emerging market is uh, sustainable maritime fuel, and that's what's interesting there is that the ship comes to you. You're not trying to sell it in Rotterdam. That means you're competing with the yes. port up the way. You're not competing with um, uh, with Santiago in Chile or with uh, uh, um, uh, uh, places in Australia. Um, and that then means that you have a local market. Hydrogen is ultimately a local commodity because you incur cost when you transport it. So you can make it at higher cost closer to where the client needs it and still have a market compared to making it at low cost in bulk at the port and still then have to transport it overland to your customer inland. So yes. it's, a, it's, it's a complex interplay of understanding what is your cost of production, what is your cost of transport, and where is your customer, how much does he want, and how does he want it? Um, and uh, that's possibly what, what scares some folk because you've got to keep all this in your head at the same time which is why it's good to develop a team. Yeah. Thanks, Thomas. Shahil Ugo, any final comments? I think we, we need to understand that uh, 
the hydrogen economy, especially in South Africa, it, South Africa is rife with opportunities. And I think we can see from this panel, there is interest from all different sectors. And uh, it's, quite, uh, it's quite comforting to knowing that there is this interest in creating value for the country, creating value for the world, and doing something about climate change at the end of the day. And I think that's where uh, the excitement of green hydrogen really lies. Thank you. Thanks, Sachin. Um, uh, Ugo? Um, I'm uh, in the same uh, opinion like Thomas. Example um, for the producing hydrogen in a local uh, form and not uh, to deliver some from one current location to other location because of the cost. But uh, if you have a chance, uh, like uh, standing in Europe or you're producing your hydrogen in Norway um, or UK, our pipelines, you can calculate it whether it is okay or not. I see uh, Morocco is a good way between Spain or the, to, to produce hydrogen in my, Morocco and uh, deliver example over pipelines to Europe. And uh, this is uh, some opportunities for us. And But I see um, in the future we can learn and see more and more uh, options and opportunities about these applications. Thanks, Hugo. That's that's great. Thank you very much for uh, all of the participants uh, or panelists for your for your participation and inputs. Um, Shannon, so I'm going to hand back to you because we are in fact on the hour. Thanks very much, Max. Um, with all of that said, that does bring us to the end of our webinar. I'd like to take this opportunity to say thank you to our facilitator, Matt Ash, for enabling an engaging discussion. Thank you also to our panelists, Thomas Ruiz from the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, um, Tashifa Bjorkas from Freeport Saldana, Ugo Unal from Stahl, and Shahil Jagannath from Engie. Thank you also to our sponsors, that's Stahl, the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, Enetrach, Engie, Heise Infrastructure, Norton Rose Fulbright, Oxion People Solutions, RTS Africa and Ukwazi for their support in making this webinar possible. And finally, thank you to the attendees for taking the time to join us for this discussion on the policies to expand investment in green hydrogen as a new clean energy source. We hope you found this event engaging and informative. Our next webinar takes place on the 10th of May at 2 p.m., where we'll be discussing local manufacturing. The link to register for that event has been shared in the chat, and we'll also communicate it in a follow-up email. The recording of today's webinar will be sent to you in due course, and if you have any additional questions, please be in touch. You can reach us at shannon at creamamedia.co.za. Thank you so much for your time, and goodbye.